My name is Brian Gallagher. I'm the communications director at uh, Ethical Systems. I manage our blog and web pages, post on social media, among other things, and help spread the Ethical Systems meme. I hope I uh, think you all agree it's a good one. I'm also a writer and editor at Nautilus, a science and culture magazine. As it happens, our first speaker, Robert Frank, a professor of economics at Cornell. Um, was profiled by Nautilus not too long ago and spoke about his latest book, Success and Luck, uh, about the myth of meritocracy, a hot topic in the news recently. Uh, fun fact, he told Nautilus that if he wasn't an economist, he would have liked to have been a cartoonist. He said he admires the craft's economy of expression. His words, not a surprise. He'll be discussing social contagion and trust. You can see up there. Um, our next speaker, the co-founder and managing partner at Navalent, will explain how there's a structure or pattern to untrustworthy or dishonest behavior. I had the pleasure of meeting Ron Karutri, who is on Ethical Systems Advisory Board a few months ago, as he helped us chart our future. It's a well-worn territory for him. He's been helping executives tackle challenges of strategy, organization, and leadership for decades, and explains his insights prolifically in places like the Harvard Business Review. And our third speaker is David Hollis, he manages cultural assessment for the Banking Standards Board, a body established not too long ago to promote higher standards of behavior and competence across banks in the UK. The assessment evaluates firms against nine ethical and professional characteristics, including shared purpose, honesty, and accountability. Please welcome Rob Frank. Thank you, and thanks uh, to John and Aziz for inviting me to attend this meeting. I've heard some of the best talks I've heard in years already, so it's, it's, it's really a pleasure. Uh, as you noted, I'm an economist. Uh, I'm going to start with sort of the caricature of the economist's view about trust in situations where people can cheat without any probability of detection. I'll, I'll refer briefly to Plato's uh, Republic, where Glaucon, his brother, describes the ring of Gyges. It's a ring that can make you invisible. Would any person behave honestly if he had a ring that could make him invisible and therefore able to commit any act he chose without any possibility of anyone know, knowing who had done it? And he concludes, no, there is no person alive who would uh, be able to resist the temptation to cheat under those circumstances. And so if people are honest, it's only because they fear being caught and punished. I think that, in, in a rough caricature, is the traditional uh, rational choice model's view of what people do in situations where cheating is impossible to, to catch and punish. Uh, it's not advancing, Aziz. Is there a manual way to do it? Um, this is not okay. I, can push I can just push yeah. this. So uh, the, the view expressed by Glaucon is both uh, too pessimistic in a way and in a way uh, not pessimistic enough. I'm going to talk about how social dynamics affect decisions involving trust. Uh, this is the, the basic uh, problem that illustrates that if you can't deliver honest behavior, that's disadvantageous not only to the ones you cheat, but also to you. This is the branch outlet problem. Uh, I'm the owner of a business. I could open a profitable outlet in a distant <coughs> location. Uh, if I could hire a manager who would manage it honestly, uh, I could pay that person a premium salary. I would earn uh, a nice rate of return on the project. That's the top branch uh, at C. Uh, I wish I could go there, but I realize that if I go to C as the owner and I open that branch, the manager is going to realize that if he manages it dishonestly, and I have no possibility of catching him, he'll get an even higher payment, uh, and I'll lose money on the deal. Therefore, I will not open the branch. I'll go on uh, outlet. I'll go. Uh, I'll move down at, at uh, node B. I get nothing, and the manager has to go work for the ordinary salary that a person who's not known to be honest. Uh, would, would be able to command in the marketplace. But what if the owner could identify somebody who 
uh, he, he or she believed would manage the venture honestly, then the owner would benefit and the manager would benefit from that. So both parties lose by virtue of their, their being unable to make that connection. So can the owner identify a person who would solve this problem? Uh, here's a thought experiment I'll ask you to consider. You've just gotten home from a crowded concert. You lost $1,000 in cash. It had been in your coat pocket uh, in an envelope with your name and address on. Do you know anyone not related to you by blood or marriage who you feel confident would return your cash if he or she found it? Uh, I won't ask you to indicate by a show of hands, but most people who think about this question say, yeah, I, I know several people I would feel confident about. Uh, most people know somebody who would return a stranger's cash in that situation. The people they name as feeling confident about is usually somebody they've known for a long time. But if you can make that kind of a prediction accurately, then you have solved the branch outlet problem. You have identified somebody to, to whom you could entrust the management of your operation. He, you could pay that person a premium salary. You would earn a nice return. Problem solved. How do they manage to identify people who would not cheat even when they know there's no possibility of detec detection and punishment? Uh, I, I do like cartoons. This is uh, one of my favorites from uh, Modell, published in The New Yorker many years ago. The, the couple is meant to be intimidated to buy a pencil they don't want because of the feel, fear that the salesman will use the whip if they don't buy a pen, pencil. Uh, the sign irrational is just the Modell's device to make sure we don't miss the point. Uh, the husband may object, well, why would he use the whip? He would go to jail for 10 years if he did that just to sell a 50 cent. Uh, we're meant to think that he's not doing the usual cost-benefit calculation. He's deciding uh, from a different perspective. And why do we think that? Why would it be plausible to think that? Look at the, the enormous economy of information in the expression on the pencil seller's face. Uh, go back to your room tonight and try to duplicate that expression uh, on your own face. You'll discover, most of you, that you can't do it. Uh, that expression tells us that the pencil salesman isn't playing by the usual rules. He's not a normal, rational, self-interested actor. And without going into any detail, there are moral sentiments that motivate people to do the right thing when no one's looking. Uh, those sentiments uh, convey themselves to, to others in a whole laundry list of ways that I don't have time to talk to you about. But uh, to the extent that they're effective in enable us, enabling us to identify people who are trustworthy in these types of situations, they benefit both us and the people who possess those sentiments. Where do people get moral sentiments? Uh, Aristotle noted that it was through practice that we get them. Uh, and here's where enforcement comes in. If the authorities set up rules and enforce them strictly and mere prudence leads people to follow the rules in most circumstances, then following the rules and doing the right thing becomes a habit. It becomes who we are. And that, in turn, leads people to do the right thing often, even when no one is looking, because it's part of their character. If we're looking for people to cooperate in ventures like this, uh, it's very important that we be able to estimate accurately the likelihood that they'll deliver when they have the opportunity to cheat us. The cues we rely on are both person-specific. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have my impressions of you and, and whether you care about my interests enough to make you not want to cheat me. But they're also informed by what I know about the population. So if I'm in a population where 90% of the people are dishonest, I'm more likely to conclude that you're dishonest with a given set of features than if it were 98% honest in the population. And that simple observation alone gives rise to an explosive social dynamics if something happens, if we increase the rate of enforcement and that leads people to be, behave in a more law-abiding way uh, in, in uh, more frequent instances. That increases my estimate that you're trustworthy. It makes me more likely to choose you in a venture that uh, requires trust. You're re rewarded by virtue of having been chosen. And 
that creates an increase in the population share that's trustworthy, and that builds on itself until we reach a very high level. If the population got to be 100 percent trustworthy, nobody would bother to scrutinize uh, his or her trading partners, and so it would be very easy for cheaters to invade that population successfully. So we get a very strong uh, social dy dynamic comes uh, from, from that simple mechanism. Here I'll talk briefly about what I call the waiter's dilemma. Uh, there are two occupations. You could work in a factory or you could wait tables. You don't care which you do. They're equally pleasant or unpleasant. Uh, the pay is essentially the same. You get paid a, uh, 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 the same salary in total. But if you wait tables, half your pay comes in tips. The tax authorities can't observe your tips. So the question is, do you pay tax on them? Uh, you're honest, and so you do. But if enough people are dishonest, uh, if there's no possibility of getting caught and punished for not paying your taxes, there will be migration from factory work to the occupation of waiting tables. Wages will be bid down in the table waiting occupation until such time as the, the <coughs> after-tax wage is the same in both occupations, and, and hence the waiter's dilemma. If you pay your taxes on your tips as a waiter, you're paying at a rate more uh, than is, is warranted by the service that you've delivered. You end, you, you end up with a lower after-tax income than you could have gotten if you'd worked in the other job. And people are very sensitive to this. Uh, here's a very interesting study done in Austria, a rule-following co country. If you move to a new uh, uh, workplace where your coworkers are more likely to cheat on a particular tax allowance, then you're more likely to cheat than you were at your previous workplace. Tax compliance is a very elastic thing. Countries differ enormously. The U.S. historically was in a very privileged position on this list of countries by tax compliance. Uh, the, the, we were not far behind the, the countries at the top. Uh, you have a much harder time running your country if you have a citizen, citizenry that's not tax compliant. And the IRS budget has been slashed dramatically in the last eight years with the result that there is uh, dramatically higher rates of tax noncompliance and we're on, on the, the cusp of really losing the advantage that we have. And that's influenced by a whole variety of <laughs> news that we read day by day. This is all material that I, I talk about in Chapter 7 of my forthcoming book. Uh, it will be out in the fall from Princeton. Uh, and thanks for your attention. And again, thanks to John and Azish for inviting me to come. Hi, everybody. My name is Ron Perucci. It's great to be here with you all. I'm a managing partner at a firm called Navalent, and I get the privilege of serving on the advisory board here uh, Ethical Systems. I also get the joy of actually embodying the partnership of practitioner and academics with uh, Azish. We get to work together in client systems uh, together, so we get to see our shared work in action uh, and get to look at sometimes the unpleasant underbelly of corporate America. Um, so I want to talk to you about today about uh, some recent research we did on, uh, on honesty in organizations. I'm sure as we all watched the news unfold this week um, uh, and over the last several years, uh, uh, we all inherently understand the fact that um, 750 parents didn't wake up one day and all at the same time say, hey, here's a way to get our kids into school. And 5,000 employees didn't wake up one day at all the same day at Wells Fargo and say, I know how to increase our cross sell revenue. And 80 engineers didn't wake up one day at Volkswagen and say, hey, we don't have to worry about electric cars. Here's a way to sell more diesel ones. We inherently understand that there were bigger forces at play than just individual behavior, individual bad choices. But we don't know what they are. We use words like it's the culture or it's some other forces. But I wanted to know why. One of the questions I typically ask leaders uh, 
in their organizations, and maybe in your some, some of your companies, you have a thing called an MBR, a monthly business review, or a quarterly business review, a QBR. You have some device that gathers leaders together uh, to talk on some periodic basis of what has just happened in the last period and what's about to happen in the next period. And I'll often ask leaders, um, for those of you who participate in those reviews or present in those reviews, how many times during those reviews, as somebody's presenting their set of results or their set of forecasts, do you think to yourself, this is such crap? <laughs> right? How many of you? Come on. But, but nobody's, the, the closest you might get to a statement is, wow, Bill, interesting forecast. <laughs> and that's about it. That's where it will stop. But we all know what that's code for. Well, is it that Bill is a sociopath? I don't think they're everybody sitting in front of a room compelled to distort the information they're presenting can be a psych psychopathic liar. So I wanted to know what, what would cause somebody to stand up in front of a room and think that that's okay. Well, this became very personal for me years ago. I was interviewing uh, the head of strategy for a $30 billion food company, doing our, one of our, our regular diagnostic interviews. And during the interview, we were debriefing the fact that they had just gone through a very tragically failed merger. They had paid $2.5 billion for a company um, that it was, a, I mean, it could not have been more one of the classic train wrecks of a, of, a, of a failed acquisition. And he said to me, well, if I'm honest, notice the qualifier, um, <laughs> we all knew it was gonna fail. We knew from the beginning we didn't have the capabilities to incorporate them in our portfolio. We didn't have the resources to make them successful in our portfolio, and we didn't have the capabilities needed to drive the segment of the food sector they're in. We don't know who we are. We've lost our way in the food industry. We don't know who we are anymore, and we're just making things up. Now, I've done thousands of diagnostic interviews like this before in my career, but what struck me about this one, as he said it to me, I thought to myself, why is it he so can freely tell me this? But when it mattered most, they couldn't tell each other. It made no sense to me, so I decided to find out. And why? Well, you, you don't need to look at many more statistics to understand that institutional trust is at an all-time low today, uh, if you look at the Edelman barometer. Um, the, the new Accenture um, <coughs> research on competitive agility and what, what a trust breach costs a company in EBITDA. Um, you know, 50% we, we, of the workforce lacks a sense of purpose and we keep blaming it on, they don't, they're not getting enough foosball and free lunches. It, it's actually deeper than that. So there's plenty of evidence to suggest, as John said this morning, our work is becoming more important. Our work to make the fabric of organizations uh, more trustworthy, and more engaged, and more honest is more important than ever. So we um, did a 15-year longitudinal study, went back and examined 3,200 interviews across 210 diagnostics, and we found that there are four factors, that at least four, but we found four for sure, that can, that can predict whether or not people would withhold or distort the truth in the organization. The first one is uh, identity, right? When we don't know who we are, we make things up. When there are accountability systems that are seen as unjust, um, when pe people feel that performance is unfairly assessed, I lie to self-protect or cover my shortfalls or exaggerate my contributions. Governance, when there's no place for the truth to be told, it goes underground. And lastly, when we uh, uh, fragment organizations, border wars, right? You have classic silos. When we fragment the organization, we create dueling truths. He here's the compelling data. If you lack strategic clarity in your organization, you are 2.81 times more likely to have people lie or tell the truth. Now, you all know, if you went around the table at your executive team meeting and asked your senior team, what's our strategy? You know you would get as many answers as there are people in the room. What do the automotive industry, the financial services industry, and higher ed industry have in common, besides being case studies we'll get to write about for years? They're all major incumbencies and disruption. Volkswagen didn't believe it could ever catch up in competing in electric or hybrid cars. Ha Wells Fargo didn't believe uh, uh, that um, a, a credit card company could become a bank. The automotive industry has been saying for years, no one's gonna take autonomous vehicles seriously. Don't you know that in higher ed, they're saying things like SNH, U, Phoenix University, they're not real schools. Well, their incumbencies are being threatened. 
And when you want to protect your identity, it's an amazingly extension go to. When you have accountability systems that are seen as unjust or unfair, you are 3.77 times more likely to have people withhold or distort the truth in your organization. When, you, uh, when your governance structures don't allow for the right leaders to sit around the right tables and tell the truth, and the truth has to go into round, you are 3.03 times more likely to have people lie or distort the truth. How many of you have a game play in your organization called, whose decision is it anyway? <laughs> right? We pick it to walk out of the meeting, and now what did we decide in there? And then we get to decide that whatever happened in the room, I went my way. So whatever, whatever the decision wasn't, I had a client once who was uh, fondly referred to by his executive staff as the waffle. Because the, they were known for playing the last one in game. The last one in got their way. So people knew how to time their lobbying before the meeting. And they would get on his calendar 15 minutes before the executive team meeting so they get their way. So that in the meeting, their decision would get announced. And lastly, and one of the most surprising things, when we, when we fragment the organization and create, we create dueling truths, you are um, 5.82 times more likely to have people lie or distort, distort the truth. These are cumulative statistics. So if you lack strategic clarity, meaning people from top to bottom, inside and outside your organization, don't understand who you say you are, and you're not acting who you say you are, if your accountability systems are seen as unfair, meaning the way, what, not, and this does not include compensation, by the way, just contribution, are not assessed fairly in the eyes of the contributor, um, if decision making is not clear and distributed uh, according to who has the authority and resources, and if you have border wars in your organization, um, you are all over 16 times more likely to be in one of the many headlines you've seen this morning on these slides. That means the ethical petri dish in your organization is growing the fungus as we speak. So, uh, you know, the, the problem I think today, and I think this John's point about polarization really makes this, well, we have conflated speaking your truth with speaking the truth. And we've can dangerously taught people that, that it's the same thing, and it's not. <coughs> and so I, I'm, on this last panel, I was struck by the fact that um, we, we've, we've sidestepped the issue of skill. We've told people that if you want to speak truth to power or speak up, a, a dis, a, a, offer a dissenting view or offer hard feedback, uh, however you say it is just fine. Well, no, it turns out it's not, right? If you haven't got the skill to withdraw your outrage, withdraw your, your petulance, withdraw your judgment, and withdraw your condescension, and make your point, then it doesn't matter how brilliant your point is. You probably won't be heard. And that's not because somebody is silencing you. It's because you made yourself unhearable. And so if we want organizations where the truth is told well, we have to prepare them to do it. Here's what we now know. Um, so uh, uh, dishonest behavior is not random. The person standing up in front of your QBR distorting information is doing it for a reason. Th there's something self-protective about why he feels or she feels compelled to do that. Doesn't excuse it. It doesn't excuse it. But it might explain it differently. It's not just about their own moral failure. Um, what we know in the research also about duplicity uh, is that if I feel I'm in an environment that's duplicitous, I feel inclined to be the same which means my sense of purpose and agency is now diluted. Um, so we, we need to look more about uh, towards self-protection versus self-interest as some of the root causes to this behavior and, this, and the systemic realities of self-protection. What can you do? So it turns out the levers of cultural and behavior reside somewhere else in the organization. They don't reside with the ethics community. But the people in strategy, the people in finance, the people in HR hold the levers that shape behavior in organizations. You can go to them. Help them create strategy processes that take an ethical lens and look at them. Help them create governance structures that allow the right leaders with the right authority and the right uh, decision power to sit around the right tables and have the right discussions. Um, you, if there are organizations designed at seams where there are border wars, the classic supply chain and logistics, sales and marketing, finance and R&D, HR and everybody, um, you know, you can help them create borders that, that create value instead of wars. You can create governance structures that allow decision rights to be shared. And you can create accountability structures that measure performance well. Help them do it, and we can change. Thank you.